Since the Starship rocket idea first appeared on paper, Elon Musk has predicted a future where the aerospace industry will prioritize vehicles that possess high performance and can carry oversized loads, then which reduces costs as much as possible. It explains why so far, despite being considered the largest rocket ever, Starship's size is always stretched to the peak. As Elon expected, the proliferation of the new field of commercial space stations has stressed the demand for vehicles with huge cargo compartments. This led to a seemingly never-before-seen new idea, launching an entire space station on a Starship rocket in a single mission. Imagine how much money you would save if you could launch a giant space station in just one or two missions instead of cutting it up multiple times and carrying each part. Find out everything in today's episode of TechMap. On January 31, SpaceX officially added a new name to its list of customers for missions on the future Starship rocket. Specifically, Starlab Space, a joint venture of Voyager Space and Airbus Space and Defense, reached an agreement with SpaceX to launch the Starlab station on Starship. The companies did not disclose the terms of the agreement or a projected launch date, although a spokesperson for Starlab Space said the company was confident that Starlab would be launched in 2028 before the decommissioning of the International Space Station, currently scheduled for 2030. Unlike other companies that split up their space stations into pieces and then launched each section, Voyager took a bolder step, carrying its entire space station in a single launch. It could be the main motivation for them to eye on the gigantic Starship rocket. Starlab will have a diameter of about 26 feet, 8 meters, or around twice the diameter of ISS modules, limiting the number of rockets that could support launching the space station in one mission. Amazingly, Starship's payload bay can accommodate vehicles up to 26 feet across in its capacious fairing. Marshall Smith, the chief technology officer of Voyager Space, said the company looked at a couple of launch options. We looked at multiple launches to get Starlab into orbit and eventually gravitated towards single launch options, he said. It saves a lot of the cost of development. It saves a lot of the cost of integration. We can get it all built and checked out on the ground and tested and launch it with payloads and other systems. One of the many lessons we learned from the International Space Station is that building and integrating in space is very expensive. The ISS is credited as the most expensive item ever built, costing around $150 billion, making it more expensive than Skylab, costing $2.2 billion, and Mir, $4.2 billion. The process of assembling the ISS has been underway since the 90s. Building the complete station required more than 40 assembly flights. As of 2020, 36 space shuttle flights delivered ISS elements. Other assembly flights consisted of modules lifted by the Falcon 9, the Russian Proton rocket, or in the case of Pyers and Poisk, the Soyuz U rocket. In addition to requiring many rockets and launches, assembling in space is also very challenging. That means you need to do some precision assembly in a space with no cranes available and no ground to push against when trying to pull the parts together. That's not enough. The reason why ISS costs the taxpayer much also comes from the rocket's general price level on the market at that time. Between 1,970 and 2,000, the cost to launch a kilogram to space remained fairly steady, with an average of $18,500 per kilogram. When the space shuttle was in operation, it could launch a payload of 27,500 kilograms for $1.5 billion or $54,500 per kilogram. For a SpaceX Falcon 9, the rocket used to access the ISS, the cost is just $2,720 per kilogram. So the pre-SpaceX cost should have been about $1 million to put a person in their underwear on the ISS. Let's say that it takes nine times a person's weight in supplies to support a person. That takes the cost to $10 million. The Russians were charging $20 million in 2000 and around $80 million in 2019. At this point, can't help but say another reason for choosing SpaceX Starship is its cost per launch. Clearly, it is a no-brainer with the cost of just $2 million per launch, much cheaper compared to other agencies. This way helps to minimize the input expense, and then Voyager and Airbus can find a diverse base of customers to offset expenses, meaning that they will serve both government customers you know NASA wants to continue flying at least a handful of astronauts in low Earth orbit for research purposes, and private customers as well. The challenge for Starlab and other commercial stations is developing a customer base beyond NASA to support the expense of flying and operating stations. 
Both NASA and the companies involved acknowledge it's unclear how big of a market there is beyond NASA for commercial stations from other governments, companies, or space tourists, creating uncertainty about how many companies can close their business cases. Companies acknowledge uncertainty about the sources of demand for commercial space stations and their size. I don't fundamentally believe there is a market yet, said Tejpal Batia, chief revenue officer of Axiom Space during a space symposium panel in April. His company is, for now, going after low-hanging fruit from individual countries and companies that have expressed interest. Is there a market? I think that is what we are all racing to figure out, he said. It's not racing to see who develops the first commercial space station. The question is, is it sustainable from a business standpoint? Starlab may have an advantage in this regard with its co-ownership by Airbus. The end of ISS leads to a big question. What happens to the European astronauts who fly there now? Honestly, the European Space Agency tends to be reticent about funding missions to private space stations owned and operated by United States companies. The involvement by Airbus, therefore, makes Starlab attractive to European nations as a destination. In preparation for the mission, both SpaceX and Starlab have been gone around the clock. For SpaceX, the fundamental requirement is to ensure the Starship reaches orbit and is reliable. The company aims to conduct the third orbital Starship flight attempt of February, which they have been very close to. The FAA is on pace to issue a Starship launch license mid to late February, signaling the smooth progress. As we have seen in the past, the largest burden on Starship launches has been related to approval rather than hardware readiness. Things have changed now as regulators are no longer so strict on Starship flights as the vehicle and its ground support systems get better and better. The company also targeted January as the deadline for hardware readiness. Both Ship 28 and Booster 10 are in the final stage before rolling out the launch site for the wet dress rehearsal test. In parallel to that, SpaceX also gets busy gearing up for Artemis 3 expected to occur no earlier than 2026, two years sooner than Starlab's timeline. The Starship's performance in Artemis 3 might be the critical base for SpaceX and Starlab to determine the certain launch date for their mission. As for the Airbus team, they continue to hunt the experts in logistics and human spaceflight for their ambitious mission, including former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein. Referring to their long-term strategy, Starlab goes towards a continuously crewed, free-flying space station which will be used to serve a global customer base of space agencies, researchers, and companies, ensuring a continued human presence in LEO and a seamless transition of microgravity. Research from the International Space Station into the new commercial space station era. Starlab will launch on a single flight, be fully outfitted on the ground, and be ready to permanently host four crew members in LEO to conduct microgravity research and advanced scientific discovery. Starlab's single launch solution continues to demonstrate not only what is possible, but how the future of commercial space is happening now, said Tom Oshinero, Senior Vice President of Commercial Business at SpaceX. The SpaceX team is excited for Starship to launch Starlab to support humanity's continued presence in low Earth orbit on our way to making life multi-planetary. The Starlab team has advanced through multiple program milestones over the past year including completion of the system's requirements review, system definition review, human-in-the-loop testing, and more. Starlab Space recently announced a teaming agreement with Northrop Grumman and plans to collaborate with the European Space Agency. Additional Starlab partners include Hilton Hotels and The Ohio State University. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature so you don't miss any space important updates. Your support is our driving force to continue delivering high-quality content. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.